Fed and all delegates. We are going to start this conference. As we discussed, we don't have any welcome ceremony. So right from beginning, I am go going to invite Dr. L. Prakash to start his speech. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We are now beginning our first session. This will be a four-hour session. We'll have four lectures. Myself, Dr. Gautam, Dr. Arvind, and Dr. Tishnu Barwa will talk about the basics of Elizaro. You all have tables in front of you with the bits and pieces there. As Dr. Gautam gives his lecture about the components of Elizaro, you can handle the components right away and know what is what. The purpose of this first session is four. Number one, to familiarize you with what this system is. Two, identify each component of the system. Three, how to attach a ring to a bone. And last, how to attach rings to one another. So this is what is our fundamental building block over which the next sessions of the conference will continue. So I have a great pleasure in starting my talk. And that, as you see, is Elizarov, the man in the machine, pathophysiology and biomechanics, and my experiences with this system. First question, do these conferences teach you anything? Can you learn much in just two days? Will you be able to practically use what you learn here? You have spent 10,000 rupees and you have spent a valuable weekend coming here. But this question will be in your mind. That do I actually learn anything from this conference? The learning curve myth, if you see, in Delhi last year, One minute. Uh. On 13 11 2016, during the last Elizabeth conference in Delhi, I demonstrated a small video of just using three pins and one and a half rings for distal radio ulnar fractures. And this was on a Sunday that we did the demo. And this was the video that was posted there. You can have a look at it. This is a Mal United Smith fracture, about 45 days old. Was posted for internal fixation by somebody. Uh, this is it. Immediately after he of the same day, you can see the smile on his face and the movements of his hand. And he has been fully functional from day one. He started driving his car on day five. There was a rapid return of function. Ligament of taxis pulled it out. And the wrist came to shape. Just three wires. He was fully functional from day one until day 85, 86, when the frame was actually removed. And uh, the next part will show you his full function at the end of three months, both clinically and radiologically. So this actually would turn out to be a much simpler method, much less invasive, much less traumatic, no scars. and. Uh, Practically excellent results compared to all forms of internal fixation, this form of delayed malunions of the distal wrist. Now, once this video was presented and we had a workshop, that happened on a Sunday. On Monday, while I was flying back to Chennai and waiting in the airport, I started getting videos and x-rays and clinical photographs from my colleagues who had attended the conference in Delhi. So they had learnt it yesterday and they were doing it today. And I'll show you the exercise which they have shown. This was it. There was one x-ray. And that's how that was pulled in. This was from, uh, I think, Gorakhpur. And this one was from Allahabad. The next one again is Dr. Yunus's case, again from Malhavan. So this workshop and conference will teach you the basics of the system, 
will make you competent enough to apply basic frames once you return, will teach you how to think in three dimensions <coughs> and place appropriate hinges to correct deformities in both axes simultaneously and should also lay the basic foundation of this wonderful and magical system. My experience with Lidra are very limited. I am not an expert surgeon. Most of the faculty are much more experienced than me. I have never been to Kurgan or Russia. About half the faculty have trained in Russia. I have not been officially trained in the system. I just learnt it on my own. So there may be lacunae and there may be some mistakes. With the other talented faculty, we will correct and teach you better. I have experimented a lot on this. I learned from mistakes. I have conducted about 63 workshops on Elizra. I introduced the system to Malaysia, Singapore, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh in the early 90s when this is practically unknown. I studied the biomechanics, attended lectures and even today conferences like these teach me a lot every day. In 1991 I wrote a book which is probably a little ahead of Asami and Frankel's books which are standard textbooks. It just ran through one edition. And on to your right is the current edition of the book which was published last year, which uh, caused a renasa in uh, Elizarov amongst oldsters who had forgotten it and initiated interest in the youngsters who were unfamiliar with the system. And so I should be happy to say that in a very small way, I have been uh, useful in repopularizing the system in this country. This talk will focus on one minute. This talk will focus on the biomechanics of bone healing, the logic behind the Elizabeth principles, Elizabeth of the man and the machine, and applications of the system. We all know that, I think I'll leave this. We all know that blood supply to the bone is either medullary or periosteal, and blood supply is the most important point which helps the bone to heal. When fracture occurs, Periosteum is torn, medullary integrity is disturbed, a fracture hematoma collects and stops when the internal pressure equals to the systolic BP. Now start the fracture healing. The hematoma resolves, soft callus, maturation, calcification, consolidation and remodeling. Fracture hematoma is like a colostrum for a newborn. And that is where the nidus for callus formation forms. When we open a fracture, we convert a simple fracture into a compound fracture. We then suck away all the valuable hematoma. What would a hematoma do in a drain tube or a suction bottle? It has to be inside the body to help the bone to heal. So, with such frightfully invasive invasions into the bone, naturally we get disasters like this. We know that micromotion is essential for healing of the bones and lot of animal experimentations have been proving this through the years. An Elizarov system is intrinsically dynamic system giving beneficial compression distraction movements in the vertical axis while providing outstanding stability in torsional angular deformities without touching the fracture hematoma. This allows an almost immediate weight bearing and directly helps blood flow and vascularization increasing perfusion by 600% or more. Either of patients are mobile and functional, often full weight bearing. It is a myth saying that it's a cumbersome thing that keeps the patient in bed for months and years. No, it is not. But all these beneficial effects are retained only as long as you use K-wires and tension them. An untensioned thick Shan screw changes the biomechanics and it's no longer an original Elizabeth. What do these two things have in common? The one here is a battle tank and one here is a bicycle. Well, these were the two factories very close to Elizabeth's place and the silencer bushings of the tank and the spokes of the bicycle were the first components of which the very first Elizabeth assembly was put on a patient. These are all not Elizabeth's. You see so many shan spins sticking out. Neither this is an Israel. See the Shansman coming out. This is definitely not an Israel. Just two right angle Shanspins. 
in my opinion there are only three magic components in lithograph one is tensioning of the wires second is corticotomy and third is control distraction once we understand these three magical things the whole lithograph system becomes easy now let us ask some questions what happens if we don't treat fractures what happens to animals with fractures when the first metal put in human body why occasionally fractures don't heal despite multiple surgeries is there any absolute indication for internal fixation wild animals in the jungle don't go for treatment an untreated horse is back to walking in 2 months dogs don't go to orthopedic surgeon this is an irish setter with a distal tibia malunite and see him after 6 months he is fully functional and back to normal he neither went to a plaster man or nor to internal fixation man untreated fractures invariably heal it may heal with shortening it may heal with overriding but it heals nevertheless we can see this uh, leg fracture in a horse it was initially abandoned but later on the horse was on its own when the first metal implanted in the human body you would be surprised to know that about 5000 years ago a mummy had an internal fixation device and this was the reason they excavated mummy which teaches us that man has been trying to play god for over 2000 years and today he thinks it is probably better than god but the worst by nature cannot compete by the worst by man this or this this or even this in surgically fixing a fracture we delay nature's attempt at fracture healing we deliberately convert a simple closed fracture into an open compound fracture and it's a well known fact that every internally fixed fracture will certainly heal slower than the one left alone an infected non union for a surgeon is just a statistic but for a patient it's a lost job missed examination ruined career marriage being denied whole household in debt for years misery 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 100% disaster multiple surgeries a fractured limb can be encased in a rigid plaster but the bones inside cannot be rigidly mobilized so multiple splints are there which will just keep the limb rigid the bones inside will keep moving micro motion of the fracture site as i have told you earlier minute motion causes callus to be thrown in the fracture now if you rotate the fracture as it heals too much of callus is thrown but it doesn't unite so that comes as a hypertrophic non union if there's an angular stress the contact point won't have callus the opposite side will have callus this will be a horse hoof non union minimal compression distraction produces healthy callus a nail provided this solution in this situation will throw up a lot of callus because it resists torsional and angular stresses while it allows linear stresses that's why when nailed fractures are slow to throw callus we just remove one screw and dynamize it so once it starts compressing it unites so logically we can know that a fracture can be treated by its rigid immobilization with compression locking plates semi rigid immobilization nails made more rigid by locking non rigid immobilization by plasters or splints rigid immobilization by pin external fixators and dynamic immobilization by traction or flexible external fixators and elizero is the one that comes in the last group of a flexible external fixator we all know the original synthy story where we had compression plates with no callus they called it primary bone healing and 2 years later you remove the plate and the fracture falls apart so the patient was using the limb on the behest of the plate not on the behest of the united bone and there is no way to tell in such fractures when the fracture is united because trabecular continuity on radiological view may be available very soon after fixation in many cases the fracture has fallen apart and the plate was removed in 8 to 9 months so right now synthesis has revised their implant removal guidelines what actually happens in compression plating the plate assumes the function of the bone bypassing the forces which now travel through it surgical trauma periosteal slipping and medullary drilling compromises the vascularity and thus all plated fractures have to considerably slower be in healing than the operated fractures what actually happens with compression plating is that 
there's a race between the bone healing and implant stresses. If the bone heals first, as it happens in majority of cases, all is well, else the plate is going to break. With intramedullary nails, it has got a good vertical compression, gives resistance to lateral shifts and angular stresses. But reaming the medulla takes away a lot of blood supply and this has a poor resistance and torsional stresses unless the nail is locked. Uniaxial fixator has got very high shear stiffness in the plane of pins but very low in 90 degree shift. Biaxial fixators have high stiffness in both lateral bending and torsion but during compression plastic deformation of these pins is usually observed. The original nails thereof is nothing but thin pins. No Shan screws. By substituting Shan screw for K wires, we lose the magical advantage of inherent dynamism. Tensioning is the process of stretching the wire to make it taut like a piano string, like your veena or a violin. This thin wire, if you stretch it both ends, it will be tinny and it has got a lot of strength. An 1.8 mm K wire tensioned at 80 kilograms is stronger than a 7 mm Steinman pin and yet inherently elastic compared to a stiff pin. This uh, tensioner which I have designed, which you'll be using in the workshop, a Sean pin will exhibit ductile behavior. And if you can see, the pins have started bending. As the patient loads, the pins have started bending. Whereas in Elizabeth, it will compress and coming out. Corticotomy is just cutting the cortex without disturbing the medulla and without disturbing the periosteum. Well, this was the original Lizov concept. It has gone, undergone some change. People now use even a giggly saw or an oscillating saw and get away with it. I would still use a corticotome for this work. Here, the periosteum is split. Multiple drill holes are made. We make partial breaks into the bone and then we break it by twisting it. The third magic of Elizov is control distraction both for bone transport and elongation and we all know what exactly it is. If you do not respect the original concept of the designer, the results may not be as good as expected. It is essential to understand the difference between a stretched wire and a stiff pin and elasticity is the key. If you look at these two, what is the difference between this and this? You can see the rim here and the rim here. Here you need a shock absorber. Here you don't need a shock absorber because these wires or the spokes themselves act as shock absorbers. So, if you look at this, likewise, pair of stretched wires on a ring in itself, despite being attached with rigid threaded rods, is still inherently elastic. Now, this is a very small story how I started laser off. Uh, the pioneer of Elizabeth of India is one Dr. R. Gopalakrishnan from Apollo Hospital who had been to Kurgan in 1987 and he was the first gentleman to get all the stuff here and when he demonstrated his limb lengthenings and bone transports, we were all shocked in the Madras Hospital Club meeting and then as a matter of challenge, I wanted to show that I too can make it. So I designed my Elizabeth which was all wrong, I used 8mm rings and 8mm threaded rods and very erratic components. However. The patient was alright and uh, the surgery went off well and we have Dr. Prasad here who had attended one of my very early workshops and he had bought my ATMM rings. We were having a big joke about it last night. Just by looking at the drawings and the x-rays I fabricated a set and used it on a 23 year old with hypertrophic non-union and rest was history. So we should not be afraid of uh, doing what our convictions teach us and what science teaches us. That's me conducting an Elizabeth workshop in Malaysia. You can see the date there, 1994. I just introduced it to University of Malaya at that time. One or two experiences of Elizabeth. This is a young girl with uh, uh, tethered cord and a neuropathic capovirus foot, fungating ulcer, advised amputation by five or six surgeons. Well, as usual, we did a minimal lateral wedge, some percutaneous corrections. And just one half ring for calcaneum, one half ring for metatarsals and one full ring for tibia. The little girl is mobile. From day one, she has never walked for four years. Her mother used to carry her. 
the day of the surgery, her leg is plantigrade and she's walking with a frame. In between, one of the carbon rings broke and I was just developing my light rings, so I changed the top ring. Over a period of time, you can see, there she is in a week's time coming to the clinic for uh, her review. And there she is at about 90 days. You can see the ulcers have all healed, the fungation has gone. And there she is walking without a support with the Elizabeth frame. And uh, once the frame is removed, for the very first time in life, she is walking with straight legs. It has taken us about 100 days, 120 days for her to reach from that bent, fungated limb to this straight limb. And just look at her in six months time. See how she's growing. She's eating well, she's living happily. And at the end of one year, when I saw her in my clinic, she had transformed into a young lady. From a tiny, scrawny little girl who was handicapped and being carried by her mother, she has become independent, she drives a bike, she plays sports, and she's living a practically normal life except for a slightly smaller foot. The length is equal now and uh, she is running and recently she got a prize in one of the sporting events and she was very happy coming to me and telling me that. So that is the magic of Elizra if it's done properly. Next one. So, it's a misconception that Elizra is cumbersome and patient unfriendly. This very tiny video will show you. This day one, again an infected non-union implant failure and pouring pus. That's in a month. And that's in three months after the removal of the implant. And he asked me if he can sit cross-legged. I told him try. And there he is, 100th day of the surgery, sitting happily cross-legged. And he was a tailor who was running the frame, running the machine, all throughout. Now, sir, some questions. If this is such a wonderful method, why is it not so popular? What is the reason for decline in the number of cases this system is currently being used? Why have surgeons moved away from this system? If we look at it, Elizabeth started in the 90s and gained rapid popularity until 2000. From 2000 to 2015 in India, it came down in a very rapid decline. By 2015, when I wrote my book, very few centers in India were doing Elizabeth. Of five medical colleges in Chennai, none of them were doing it. They were not exposed to it. When people who were exposed to it left, they took the technology with them. One is, there is a deviation for the, from the original design. And the original Israel concepts have undergone a change for worse or dilution. Second, internal fixation is far easier, radiologically satisfying. Unlike this, which looks scary and gory. Plates are far cheaper. Though Elizra works out to be cheaper in the longer run, because of the reusability system, putting a couple of plates and screws, you can get away with uh, 10,000 rupees, whereas a frame, you may have to spend 20, 25, 30,000 rupees for the first time. Elizabeth needs a lot of pre-operative planning and preparation. This is a Japanese calligraphy artist and it's a, a lucky experience if you're able to see them write. They write beautifully. So they have a blank paper and he'll be staring at the paper for about an hour, looking into the grains of paper even before dipping the brush into the ink. But once he dips the brush, in few seconds he'll do off a beautiful drawing. That's because before he touches the brush, Mentally, he plans repeatedly what he's going to do, what he's going to do. And once he perfects it, he finishes the job in a jiffy. In either of two, you have to spend much more time before the surgery and after the surgery than during the actual surgery. One small question. Uh, it was an important slide, we have to go back to it. Is there a role of Elizabeth in primary close fractures? Well, this is a question we are going to attempt to answer. And we have on our faculty one Dr. Himanshu from Saranpur, who is now one of the emerging Elizabeth surgeons, who's been doing them in a large number of closed fractures as an alternative to plates and plasters. And his results are spectacular. 
That's something we must all learn from him. In my view, such fractures are best managed with Eliezer of than with any form of internal or external fixation. Of course, you can go conservative for them if you want, but fractures like this, it will be like a biscuit dipped in tea. So if you put a plate, the whole thing is going to crumple and the results are pretty disastrous. Ligament or taxes for intra-articular fractures, the Eliezer of has got a definite role, which you'll be learning. It's a versatile, elegant system. This case belongs to Dr. Yunus. Just one straight plate, one olive wire for push down, and four wires. And you see this lateral clavicle gets off so beautifully. For that matter, Elizabeth purists believe that even in ligament injuries, you don't need a reconstruction. Fresh ligament injuries, if you, cons if you compress them together and maintain them rigidly immobile, the ligaments heals. I don't have personal experience, nor this X-ray belongs to me. But it's something I must learn. The Elizabeth of purists will find applications everywhere. Skull, spine, pelvis and the works. But this workshop is not for all that. We are only going to teach you primarily how to use Elizabeth in conditions like this. For congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia, no other method even comes anywhere close to Elizabeth methodology, as Dr. Kirpat will subsequently tell you. Likewise, this one, this is a failed masculate and by Elizabeth, it could come into place. Couple of misconceptions that the learning curve is very long. No, it is not. We had a conference in Delhi on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We had 20 surgeries happening all over the country. Guys who are doing it for the first time with spectacular results. So the learning curve is not large. Difficult procedure. Again, wrong. It's not a difficult procedure. People who want to keep it exclusive spread a myth that it is a specialist job and you have to send him to that center. Every one of you can and will do it beautifully. Time consuming, again wrong. If you do a prefabricated construct pre-operatively, the wire passage time, 8 wires, 6 wires, 10 wires, is not going to be too much. And I personally don't think the training in a specialized center is all that essential. However, once you learn the technique, you can go to one of these centers and spend some time to brush up on your knowledge. The talk so far would have told you that all these are misconceptions and any orthopedic surgeon can learn to apply a frame in a single day. And you will learn to do it today if you don't know to do it already. My efforts, I have made some ultralight rings. The rings you'll be seeing today in your workshop are uh, a special aluminum alloy which is heat treatable, making them very light. In addition, I have made some lightweight nuts and bolts and some design improvements which we will be talking about at the appropriate time. Books, social medias and support from delegates like you has really helped me to popularize the system. My crusade has led to many new surgeons starting this procedure, many who had abandoned it to resume it, stimulated many a surgeon to begin Elizra as a primary procedure instead of IRF. And more than that, it has helped me tremendously. These conferences have taught me many, many new things. It has taught me how to make plastic sawbones for workshop. It has taught me how to make silicon rubber dies. It has taught me how to make flexible rubber models. And these are casts taken from patient's body on which I have made. It has helped me to design and develop these rings. I have learned casting technology, even have a small furnace in my house. So, you continue to learn as you teach. Take these lessons back home and pass them on. Knowledge expands by sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I now invite Dr. Gautam Chaudhary to carry on and uh, speak about the various components of the Elizabeth system. And this time we are keeping the lights on in the hall as he is talking about a specific component. You can pick up the component from the box in front of you and familiarize yourself with that component. Thank you. <laughs>